We consider graph sequences and introduce the notion of convergence in terms of homomorphism densities. We use this convergence notion to define graphons as the limit objects of convergent graph sequences. Consider a sequence of graphs Gn with growing number of nodes n. Each of the graphs in the sequence is characterized by a set of vertices Vn, a set of edges En, and an adjacency matrix Sn. The graphs in the sequence may be weighted or not. Thus, the entries of Sn need not be binary. They can be general edge weights. We also point out that we are using Sn harking back to the concept of graph shift operator, but we are restricting our attention to adjacency matrices. Sn is not an arbitrary matrix representation of the graph. We have already intimated that we want to study graph sequence Gn that converges to a graph on W as n goes to infinity. This is illustrated by the sequence of uniform random graphs on the bottom of the slide, which converge to the uniform graph home. But, and as we already intimated as well, it is unclear how the sequence converges and in what sense it converges to the graph home. To understand convergence of graph sequences to graph homes, we have to begin, begin with the introduction of three concepts motives, homomorphisms, and homomorphism densities. A motive F is a graph. It can be any graph, but it is convenient to think of it as a small graph that we could embed into another larger graph. An example of a motive is the star graph, which we show on the left, made up of a center node and three satellite nodes. This motive can be embedded into the larger graph as we show on the right. It is important to observe that the motive can be embedded into the graph in multiple ways. For example, this is another place where the star motive can be embedded. This is another. And this is another. There are many other more ways in which we can embed the star motive into this graph. Another possible motive is the cycle graph with four nodes. This motive can be embedded into the large graph on the right as shown. It can also be embedded in this other place, or this other place, or yet this other. As was the case of the star graph, it can be embedded in multiple places. An important observation is that the number of ways in which we can embed the cycle motive is, in all likelihood, different from the number of ways in which we can embed the star motive. Another example of a motive is this hexagon motive, which is in fact a cycle with six nodes. The hexagon motive can be embedded as shown, and it can also be embedded here, and here, and here. Likely, the number of ways in which we can embed the hexagon motive is different from the number of ways in which we can embed the cycle or star motive. Before we move onwards, we need to define homomorphisms formally. A homomorphism is an adjacency preserving map from a motive F into a graph G. Thus, if the motive has vertices V prime and edges E prime, while the graph has vertices V and edges E, a homomorphism is a map beta from the nodes of motive F into the nodes of graph G, such that if IJ is an edge in the motive F, that is, an element of the edge set E prime, then the map images beta of I and beta of J are an edge of the graph G an element of the edge set E. It is ready to verify that this is true of the homomorphisms we have illustrated. As we have already emphasized, a motive F can be embedded into a graph G in multiple ways. There are multiple homomorphisms from a motive F to a graph G. For the star graph, this is a possible homomorphism function. This is a second possible homomorphism. This is a third, and this is a fourth. There are many more. The count of all homomorphism functions is the quantity hom of f g. It is the total number of ways in which we can embed the motive into the graph. Related to the notion of homomorphism count is the notion of homomorphism density. To define this, observe that if the graph G has n nodes and the motive F has n prime nodes, there are a total 
to uh, n to the n prime different maps from f to g. Only a fraction of these total number of maps are homomorphisms. We therefore define the homomorphism density of the motif f into the graph g as the fraction of maps that are homomorphisms. That is, the ratio between the homomorphism count home of f and g and the total number of maps n to the n prime. We denote the homomorphism density as TFG. This is a relative measure of the number of ways in which the motive F can be mapped into the graph G while preserving the adjacency structure of the motive. It is therefore a quantity that we can expect to settle into a limit. As the size of the graph grows, the number of possible homomorphisms grows, but so does the total number of possible maps. The definition we have just given can be extended to weighted graphs. The extension is not complicated, but it gets a little more cumbersome. Consider a graph with adjacency matrix S, whose entries are not necessarily binary. The homomorphism density of, of motive F into the weighted graph G is defined as shown. This definition still divides by the total number of possible maps n to the n prime, but the numerator is a different expression. The expression looks quite different from the homomorphism count, but is actually quite similar. We are still counting the total number of homomorphisms. This is what the sum over different beta signifies. But each homomorphism is weighted by the product of the edge weights in the homomorphism image. If we map the motif into large edge weights, we multiply by larger numbers. We add a large value to this weighted homomorphism count. If we map the motif into small edge weights, we multiply by smaller numbers. We add a small value to this weighted homomorphism count. We still have a third definition of homomorphism density to introduce. This is the homomorphism density of a graphon. This is akin to the definition that we have just introduced for weighted graphs, except the sum is replaced by an integral. Observe how the definition uh, of the products are over the edges and vertices that define the motif. This integral has a very simple interpretation. It is the probability of drawing the motif f from the graphon w when we sample n prime nodes from the graphon. With these definitions in place, we can now define convergent graph sequences. A sequence of undirected graphs gn converges to the graphon w if and only if, for all motives F, the homomorphism density of motive F into the graph GN converges to the homomorphism density of motive F into the graph on W as n goes to infinity. Convergence of graph sequences to a graph on entails convergence of the homomorphism densities of all motives. We therefore say that the sequence GN converges to W in the sense of homomorphism density. An important aspect to emphasize of this definition is that every graphon is the limit object of a sequence of convergent graphs. The complementary observation, namely that every convergent graph sequence converges to a graphon, is also true. Moreover, the graphon W is independent of the labeling. For an example of convergent graph sequences, consider a sequence of random graphs Gn drawn from the graph on W as shown on the bottom of the slide. Each graph Gn has labels Ui drawn uniformly at random from the unit interval. And the edge set is such that nodes Ui and Uj are connected with probability W, Ui, Uj. It can be shown that this graph sequence converges to the graph phone in the homomorphism density sense with probability 1. The figure on the slide illustrates a stochastic graph sequence drawn from the uniform graph phone with a growing number of nodes. The limit of the sequence is the uniform graph phone from which the graphs are drawn. The almost sure convergence of the random graph sequence to the graph phone from which the graphs are drawn holds not only for this particular choice of graph phone, but also for all graph phones. We close this video with a concept that will be useful in later discussions. This is the notion of the graphon induced by a graph. The point is that every undirected graph admits a graphon representation, which we call its induced graphon.
Formally, consider a graph G with n nodes and graph shift operator S in which the weights have been normalized to be between 0 and 1. We construct a partition I1 through IN of the unit interval, in which the intervals II are regularly spaced. The ith interval goes from I minus 1 over N to I over N. This is what is called the regular partition of the unit interval with N subintervals. We define the induced graphon WG by assigning weight SIJ to the image of the graphon on the Cartesian product between intervals II and IJ. That is, if the argument U belongs to partition I sub I and the argument V belongs to partition I sub J, we assign the value S sub IJ to the induced graphon, the weight that corresponds to the edge that matches the cardinality of the intervals. The figure illustrates this construction for the graphon induced by the cycle graph with six nodes. The colored regions are the parts of the graphon in which we assign non-zero values. Each of them corresponds to one of the edges of the cycle. 